So they may not have been the place of Nishringa Dave, but it may have been a, a Shringa Narayan mm. temple. It might have been a temple of Lord Narayan. And the story they say, the, his, uh, the local law is that there was a king, a Hindu king from uh, Indonesia, who was on his ship passing by near Singapore, and he saw a reddish lion. And uh, his name was Sang Nila Utama. Sang Nila Utama. That's how the Malays pronounce it. Uttama would be, Nila means blue and Uttama means topmost, but in Malay it's Uttama, Sang Nila Uttama. And he, uh, then he came on the island because of that red lion attracted him, reddish colored lion that he saw. But it seems when he came on, he searched, he couldn't find it. And that's why they named it Singapore, something like that. So then, but uh, most Indians were there today, the British, you know, when slavery became uh, unfashionable internationally, they introduced indentured labor. They gave uneducated people, only those with short fingers, you know, no intelligent ones allowed to just put their thumbprint on a document saying that, signing a contract and tell them, oh, we'll take you to uh, Sri Lanka, just nearby, and then send them off to Fiji, you know, and people were there. So they did it in Mauritius and in Malaysia as well. Malaysia had the rubber plantations and then they'd supply them cheap alcohol all the time so that they'll never leave the, uh, you know, they'll be hooked, hooked on alcohol. So even today, like all the people who live in the estates in Malaysia, they are addicted to uh, alcohol, ruin the community. Now the biggest number of gangs in Malaysia are all Indians. The prisons are full of Indians, but the Indians were the ones who brought language and civilization to them. But these people were brought in uneducated, you know, as uh, laborers only. But there were other persons who had come there and settled there, like educated persons looking for work or job, like my, my grandparents were later in, uh, in flux. Do you happen to know the uh, name of the Philippines before it was the Philippines? Oh, no, I don't. Actually, I was just thinking yesterday, because last night I was at the home of a Filipino. Uh, my friend is married to a Filipino, and I was thinking they they seem to have such strong Western, uh, even in their accent when they speak English. It's the only part of that area which was, which doesn't, which I, I don't seem to have come across. I haven't visited also uh, much of the Hindu heritage, but interestingly enough, Indonesia is the biggest Muslim country in the world. But they're very proud of their Vedic heritage. Their national airlines is Garuda. Well, every single island, yes. the highest volcano, uh -huh. is called Mount Meru. Oh. On every island, nearly every single island of Indonesia, if there's mm -hmm. a volcano, it's, it's called, called Mount Meru. Mm -hmm. Occasionally called Mandara. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, I'm just asking your, your thoughts on this. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that you will know. Mm -hmm. The country Kenya mm -hmm. sounds to me, if you pronounced it properly, would mm -hmm. be actually Kenya. Because in English, they wouldn't put I and Y mm. as two letters together in a word. I see. And I think the English would uh, short form it to make it easier for them. Mm. But it seems to me that... It could be a name of the Lord, eh? Well, I think that it would be Kania Kumari, as the country would be named after Kania. And that's why the mountain there... Oh, I see. But you might be mixing up two words there, because Kanya means maiden. Kanya Kumari means maiden. And Krishna's name was Kana, Kanaya. Kanaya, like, you know, Kana, Kanan. These were his nicknames. So it's a little different, Kan is short and long, you know. So to be, but I don't know much about African history, but I remember my father telling me that uh, he had a big, uh, I think, like coffee table book he had seen, who was, which was in the hands of uh, uh, Bhima Prabhu. Bhima is uh, Hamsadutta Maharaja's uh, disciple and strong supporter. He, He's a doctor from uh, Indonesia, Chinese uh, ethnicity, and he has this book. And there, there were paintings of uh, photos of paintings in all the ancient churches in Europe, and all of them, Jesus and his disciples, all wearing tilak, and all the churches that were more than 500 years old. And there's a verse in the Bible where God says, uh, "Go and slay everyone." He tells his soldiers, "Go and slay, them, but spare those with the mark on their forehead." And then the same devotee Bhima had gone to China and he found many ancient temples there. Had engravings of, for example, the Narasimha killing uh, uh, Hiranyakashipu and so on and many other uh, traces. And I remember uh, in the late 70s, I think, the, and with this you could find it on the uh, internet if you Google it, the ambassador, Chinese ambassador to America who said that uh, Without sending a single border, a troop, a, a soldier across the border, long ago India conquered China culturally. 
and I met an elderly man, my father's a business associate, uh, who at the age of 70 or 60 or something, he went to China for the first time. He was a third or fourth generation Singaporean. And when he went back to China, he told me this, I can't remember the details, but he did tell me, he said, when I went back to China and I saw the people in my village and all that, I could understand that every tradition, and everything they have in China had come from India. And of course, with the Emperor Ashoka established the world's first university, Nalanda University, and my Guru Maharaj told me that he trained up preachers of such high caliber that they were able to effectively spread Buddhism from India as far as Korea and even Japan. So he said, that's what I want my University of Bhagavata culture to be like, to train up high caliber preachers who will successfully spread Krishna consciousness all over the world in a proper way. I asked him once, what's your vision for your university which you're struggling so hard to establish? He said, 20 years from now, by the influence of this university, just like Nalanda University, every Hindu temple on this planet, the chief priest should have PhD in Pujari Seva. So I think it's very nice, the concept of protecting Brahmanas and taking care of them. Thank you for that. Yes. So, <clears throat> what are some of Krishna's other nicknames? You said Kanna. Kanaya. Kanaya. Yeah, Kana, Kanna. These are some that come to my mind. They're like nicknames, affectionate names, you know. And there must be so many, he has thousands and millions of names. And this happens to come to mind. I can't think of any others which are as a nickname. The other names, you know, so many names are like Murli Dhara and Govinda and Gopal. And as Haridas Thakur points out in the Harinam Chandamani, there are two types of names of God. One is sort of functional because it refers to his function like Jagatpate, you know, the father of the universe, but on, on Narayana, the maintainer of everyone. But there are other names like Gopal and Dhamodara, which refer to his leelas, his loving pastimes with his devotees. And those are more intimate and personal and they're much more powerful spiritually because they are imbued with so much of love rather than formally looking at him to see his functions or his uh, you know, powers. Do you, um, in your studies, do, can you see any other evidences that once Vedic culture and Sanskrit was originally all around the world? Mm. Yes, uh, wasn't it? Uh, is it Stephen Rosen? No, uh, who, one of our scholarly devotees who published a book, Evidences of Vedic uh, Culture All Over the World. He had collected, he, for several years he had been uh, I think collecting information from devotees all over the world, uh, with, um, even I think things connected with the Mayan civilization, the Aztec civilization, and uh, others. Well, from a linguistics point of view, it seems that most scholars, you know, uh, lingu what do you call it, linguistic archaeology or something like that, they, they say that it's undeniable that Sanskrit is the mother of all languages. And from our point of view, we've all been programmed so deeply with this modern worldview, you know, that God created this world just recently, uh, a short while ago. But the creation is actually eternal, the cycle is going, if God is eternal and we are all eternal, Only the only thing is we are changing our bodies now, so we are not eternal, you know, but we are eternally changing our bodies in the material world. To get liberation means we can get a spiritual body and go back to the spiritual world and be with God. The, if God can design the atom, why can't he be clever enough to speak and communicate and read and write? Sanskrit is God's language, God is not illiterate, you know. We are trying to measure God like the frog in the well, uh, kind of thing. And it, well, the NASA report which I told you about, Rick Pricks, he says that whether we like it or not, look at this computer here, computer here, and he says that whether we like it or not, in India, 7,000 years ago, a perfect machine language was existing. And NASA should stop wasting millions of dollars researching and developing new computer languages because finally when any computer language does become perfect, then it will be as good as Sanskrit already is for the purpose of uh, programming computers. So many evidences of higher design, and also things like the architecture in India, the buildings that they have built. There's like one temple with a huge block of stone right on top of it, and they have no idea how they could have put it up there. Maybe by mantra technology, or maybe by building ramps and rolling it up, or whatever. Yes, well, I read recently that the Konark Temple of the Sun mm. um, once had a, a lodestone, which was a magnetic stone mm. and then it had a kailash pot on the mm. top so that means that at one time of the day one time of the year if you were standing on the west side you'd actually see the sun come out of the pot oh. and then if you went around to the east side as the sun set the sun would go back into the pot oh, but the um, british sailors of the day when they were sail sailing up the east coast it would disturb their navigation right I yes. heard, because it was such a powerful magnet Yes. So then what happened? Then they had it dismantled and that's when the Connacht Temple started to collapse. Oh. And nobody knows what they did with that lodestone because 
if it was still around, they could re just reinstall it and refurbish the temple. I see. But they haven't been able to find it, so whether they melted it down or whatever they did, oh, who knows. Mm. But it virtually destroyed the entire sun god worship in that part of Orissa. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> according to Jean D. Matlock, mm. the word Chihuahua mm -hmm. is a mispronunciation of the word Shivava. So it means Temple of Shiva. But, um, so that may be some of the Aztec or the um, South American connection is, I think they're mainly Shiva and Kali worshippers in that part of the world. I don't think that that's derogatory. What I'm mm. saying is that to the north of Chihuahua, you mm. have California, oh. and to the south you have uh, the city Kali in Colombia, mm. and the people there are called Kali Ma. So to me, if you look at the central part mm. and then east and, sorry, north and south of that place mm. to have a Shiva reference and then two Kali references mm. to me means